Today we are going to read the story of Big Brown Bat by Rick Krastowski. Shadows reach across fields one evening in June. As the warm glow of sunset fades, butterflies and songbirds settle into sleep. Now the sky belongs to night creatures. Big brown bats wake up in their secret roost. They live up in the rafters of a farmhouse attic. The room is dark and quiet like a cave. But this cave is hot and dry, the perfect place for a nursery. The bats rush off on their nightly hunt. They stretch their wings and drop into the air one by one, flapping and circling around an air vent the bats squeeze through the narrow slats to the outside world. One bat stays behind. She hooks her thumb claws into a rafter and hangs down. Soon she gives birth to a wrinkly pink bat pup. She cradles him in her tail apron and licks him clean. The pup can't see yet, but he can hold on. He snuggles under her, his mother's wing and drinks the warm milk she makes for him. A few nights later, the, mo the mother bat leaves her pup alone while she hunts. He clings to the rafter upside down and calls for her to return. His squeaking cries echo through the darkness. Finally, at dawn, she returns to feed him. The pup grabs onto her fur and purrs himself to sleep like a kitten. Over the next week, the other bats have babies. While they hunt, their babies stay close together to keep warm. The oldest pup dangles from the rafter and pumps his wings for practice. He is almost strong enough to fly. When the pup is three weeks old, he lets go of the rafter and plunges into darkness. Whoosh! His wings flash open and catch the air. The young bat flies with his hands. His long fingers and short arms are wrapped between two layers of rubbery skin. When he spreads his fingers, his wings open wide. He pumps the air to dash forward, loop, swoop, spin. He flips in midair and tries to snag the rafter with his toe claws. After lots of fluttery stumbling, he finally grabs hold. One week later, the mother bat weans the pup off her milk. He is a young bat now and needs to hunt for his supper. He follows his mother out the air vent and gets his first look at the vast starry sky. Just then, his mother zips by, chasing a June bug. The bat leaps off the building and soars after her. He watches her swoop down on the beetle and scoop it up in her tail apron. Like his mother, the young bat uses his ears when hunting. As he flies, he opens his mouth and shrieks into the darkness. The pulses of sound spread like ripples on water. They bounce off objects and return to his ears as echoes. The bat gets clues from each echo. Together, they create a snapshot of the world around him, trees, houses, other bats. An insect is flapping its wings up there in the treetop. It has skinny legs, long antenna. It's a moth. The bat pinpoints his prey. He shrieks faster, 30 pulses per second, 50, now 75. The echoes return at a furious pace. The moth has a secret weapon. She can hear the bat shrieks with pairs of ears on her back. She dodges left, whirls upward, then swirls right, but the bat flies straight and cuts her off. Just before the bat attacks, he shrieks 200 times per second. The echoes are so close together, they return as a buzz of information. He rushes in for the kill. The moth has one last chance to escape. She folds up her wings and dies from the sky like a fighter plane, just out of reach. The bat doesn't go hungry for long. He learns quickly that a June bug is easier to catch than an underwing moth. 
He bites through the beetle's armor and tastes his first insect meal. After a week, the bat is a hunting machine, gobbling up one half of his own weight in insects each night. In July, the bat eats cucumber beetles. In August, he eats leafhoppers. And in September, he hunts for green stink bugs. By fall, the bat is fully grown and padded up with extra weight. The stored fat will keep him alive through the winter. Cold nights and hard freezes tell the bats that it's time to leave the attic. The bat follows his mother across farm fields and down a ravine where limestone cliffs hide secret caves. He skims one last drink from the river, then disappears into the hideaway. During the icy winter, the bat clings to the face of a stone wall. For six months while he hibernates, blood barely flows through his veins. Some days his body temperature falls below freezing. He's still alive, just waiting for spring. When the snow finally melts and insects buzz through the field, the bat and his family will wake up and own the night sky once again. The end. Bats play a really important role in our ecosystem, and it's really good to support plant populations of the wild. Here at Thousand Islands, we've teamed up with Lawrence University to study how many bats and what types of bats we have living here on the conservancy zone. As you see behind me here on this tall pole, this is something called a bat monitor. So at this bat monitoring station, we uh, supply power through the solar panel that you see on there at the very top. It's a small little microphone. And inside is a handheld device, like a little computer, that will actually record the bat calls, that echo location, what they use to find their food. And it'll record that on a, a memory card. And we are actually able to identify what species of bats we have here on the Conservancy Zone by the frequency or the sound of their calls. So it's really fascinating for us to figure out how many bats we have living here, what species of bats we have that live here, and how their populations are doing. So it's a really awesome project. If you ever get a chance to stop down at Thousand Islands, make sure to take a look at our bat monitoring station. So if you're wondering on what you can do to uh, help support bats as well, um, giving them a spot for their nurseries, a little roosting spot is one of the best things that you can do. So you can oftentimes purchase or even build your own bat house, put it on a nice sunny side of your house, up as high as you can get it, and hopefully those bats will use that house in order to raise their young, just like we saw in the video. I know people don't always get too excited about bats being in their attic or in their house. Just know that if you have one in your house, it's important to make sure to treat it with respect and to treat it carefully to very safely get it back outside. Um, if you ever have any issues, uh, call us down here at Thousand Islands and we can refer you to a couple of um, animal control specialists that uh, do really well with working with bats and getting them safely outside and hopefully sealing up your house so that you don't get more bats in there. One of the fun projects that we had going on here at Thousand Islands a couple of years ago was working with some Eagle Scouts who built this right here, uh, which is called a bat condo. So a bat condo is a bat house on a much larger scale. If it were fully occupied with little brown bats, which is what the bat condo is designed for, it could hold up to 3,000 of the little brown bats. And once again, this would be their summer home. So little brown bats are going to hibernate in caves over the winter time. But in the summertime, they need a spot to have their pups and to raise them. So that's what this is for. Uh, we've had this on site for a few years now. Um, and the unfortunate news is I don't think we've had many occupants. But what we've been able to discover through our bat monitoring station is that we don't have real high populations of little brown bats here at Thousand Islands. We have a few of our other bat species that are not in this So instead of it being a real functional uh, thing to have for our bats out here, it's become a great educational point, a great talking point for people to understand the importance of bats. So I certainly hope after our story and seeing a couple of our different bat uh, projects that we have had going on here, I hope you will all take a look at bats with a, a different mindset and realize how beneficial they are.